When you're an observer, what you seem to be doing, the key operation is equivalencing states. Instead of creating the new, you're going from lots of different states and saying, I don't care about the detailed differences between these states. I'm just going to aggregate them all together. Let me make sure I understand this about consciousness. So you're saying that it's a feature of conscious observers that we believe we have a single thread of experience. So we're effectively performing this kind of sequentialization, I've heard you use that word, of a basically parallel universe that's core to our consciousness. Yes. So where I find it hard to wrap my head around this is like if we exist as conscious beings across many branches of history, how is it that there's not just like many versions of me across many timelines with many different perceptions of many different universes? that are entirely distinct. How is it that it comes together into a single consciousness? Right. So, I mean, you could say there could be many versions of you that have different perspectives on the world based on the fact that different parts of your eye, so to speak, are seeing slightly different things. Right. But the fact is that the whole of you equivalences together, you know, sort of knits together the things from one part of your visual field and another part of your visual field. And so, what I think is happening, and it is hard to wrap one's, one's head around, and I, 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 I also have this difficulty, so to speak, <laughs> that one is aggregating these different branches of history. And the whole point is that because, and, and this is sort of a, a, a key thing that, that I think people in thinking about quantum mechanics sort of didn't, didn't internalize as much as they could have done, the idea that there can be many worlds, many sort of branches of history, that idea has existed in quantum mechanics. Yeah. What is not so obvious is that there can be merging as well as branching. And I think the reason that was not so obvious is that that idea of merging depends on having a discrete system. If everything is continuous, there's no possibility. You know, you've got these two branches. One of them has 1.723, you know, some long series of digits. The other one's going to have a slightly different series of digits. They're never going to merge. But once you have a discrete system, it becomes obvious that you will get merging. So in other words, that, that even though these threads of history were different, they will end up evolving to the same outcome. Now, by the way, once you've seen that in the discrete case, you could realize how you could use a bunch of fancy mathematics to see how that would work in the continuous case as well. But it's not an obvious phenomenon in the continuous case. It is an obvious phenomenon in the discrete case. I mean, I, I think this, that sort of story of things that aren't obvious, and you know, mathematics has been very big on the idea of con continuity and the kinds of mathematical structures you can build from that. There are many things that are not obvious in that case. For example, the whole idea of computation is not obvious for, in continuous mathematics. And so phenomena like computational irreducibility, while they occur in continuous mathematics, they're not obvious there. It, it takes looking at the discrete system to make that obvious. And the same is true, I think, of this merging of history as well as branching of history. So I think the thing to realize is that if it was the case, so, so okay, let, let me un unwind another piece of this. So at some level, we could think about the universe as just branching, just keeps on branching, 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 branching. But it turns out many of those branches are the same. So if you are if you're trying to, and this is again something, it's, it's difficult to wrap one's head around this, and I'm not sure, I, th I think I'm most of the way there. Um, the, that, you know, you have these different branches, and they, at some level, sort of from the outside the universe view, every branch is separate. But the fact is, many of these branches are identical. They have exactly the same thing happening on them. And so that means that, in some sense, if you're embedded within the system, the the, the impression that you have will not be that these are two separate branches. It, it, it's, they will be, they'll, I mean, it's, what's a good analogy? I think, um, uh, I don't know, let's say you have two users of a computer system and they have the exact same login and they have the exact same everything else. It's like, are they really two different users? You know, in what sense are they different? It's, it's we can just conflate them. We can say they're yeah. the same. And, and our experience of them will be that they are the same. And I think that's, that's kind of what's happening there. And, but it is important that there's this merging, because if there wasn't this kind of merging or this merging of things becoming identical, then it could be the case that we're off and we're, we're on different branches 
and those branches will never become consistent. It's the idea that there is this merging and the merging is inevitable and that 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 achieves this consistency. Now, you know, this this sort of at a more formal level, there's this idea of causal invariance that I came up with back in the in the 90s um, that uh, is some um, is this idea that you can take different you can take different microscopic orderings and the result will always be the same. And this is uh, knowing that these systems will exhibit causal invariance is kind of tricky. In some cases, you can explicitly see that. This is one of the things that held me up in the 1990s, that I was looking for causal invariance in these systems with graphs. It's harder to see there. It's just a lot, a lot of technical mess. Um, in the end, in the Rouliad, causal invariance is really quite inevitable. It, the, the way that the Rouliad kind of factors down to a specific kind of uh, choice of what particular rule one attributes to the universe, it's a little bit trickier to see how causal invariance works there. And there's more that should be kind of really formally presented about how that works. Um, but, but roughly, the idea of causal invariance is in the end the idea that it doesn't matter which microscopic path you took, you'll always end up in the same place. And, and it's that fact that means that yes, there are different, you know, you could say we're on a different branch right now, but, or, you know, some neuron, let's say, has, uh, it doesn't quite work this way, but we could sort of, for the sake of sort of a thought experiment, we could say one of my neurons picked this branch, another picked that branch, but yet the whole operation of my brain and my mind is such that I'm going to cohere together the effect of those neurons and conclude that I have this particular experience. Now, you know, part of what this depends on is the notion of what's going on in an observer. And this, this idea, when, when you're, as a computer, you're always sort of creating the new. You're saying, I've got this state, I'm going to apply rules, I'm going to get a new state. When you're an observer, what you seem to be doing, the key operation is equivalencing states. Instead of creating the new, you're going from lots of different states and saying, I don't care about the detailed differences between these states. I'm just going to aggregate them all together. And, and that's kind of the, the experience of being an observer is the experience of seeing the output of that aggregation process. But that process is ultimately running in, you know, how do the neurons come to agreement about what they, what they think the word, next word should be? Well, they do that by all sorts of connections between neurons. And, you know, if we have an artificial neural net, we can kind of see the way that sort of the activations build up and all this kind of thing. There is a process that is aggregating, that is essentially in that case, sort of developing consensus about what the next thing should be. And we know that there is a, a process by which that happens. And it's a process which in, in our models, we can start to kind of tease out the dynamics of that process independent of, of, of the, it's sort of a separate process from the computational process that builds the future. This is a process that knits together different possible futures, but it too is something that is happening through time, that is happening in, there's a, a process that's happening that is leading to that, that building up of consensus, so to speak. <laughs>